Chapter Nineteen of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter Nineteen. Of the several kinds of commonwealth by institution, and of succession to the sovereign power. The difference of commonwealths consisteth in the difference of the sovereign or the person representative of all and every one of the multitude. And because the sovereignty is either in one man, or in an assembly of more than one, and into that assembly either every man hath right to enter, or not every one but certain men distinguished from the rest, it is manifest there can be but three kinds of commonwealth. For the representative must needs be one man, or more. And if more, then it is the assembly of all, or but of a part. When the representative is one man, then is the commonwealth a monarchy. When an assembly of all that will come together, then it is a democracy, or popular commonwealth. When an assembly of a part only, then it is called an aristocracy. Other kind of commonwealth there can be none, for either one, or more, or all, must have the sovereign power, which I have shown to be indivisible, entire. There be other names of government in the histories and books of policy, as tyranny and oligarchy, but they are not the names of other forms of government, but of the same forms misliked. For they that are discontented under monarchy call it tyranny, and they that are displeased with aristocracy call it oligarchy. So also they which find themselves grieved under a democracy call it anarchy, which signifies want of government and yet I think no man believes that want of government is any new kind of government. Nor by the same reason ought they to believe that the government is of one kind when they like it, and another when they mislike it, or are oppressed by the governors. It is manifest that men who are in absolute liberty may, if they please, give authority to one man to represent them every one, as well as give such authority to any assembly of men whatsoever and consequently may subject themselves, if they think good, to a monarch as absolutely as to other representative. Therefore, where there is already erected a sovereign power, there can be no other representative of the same people, but only to certain particular ends, by the sovereign limited. For that were to erect two sovereigns, and every man to have his person represented by two actors that, by opposing one another, must needs divide that power, which, if men will live in peace, is indivisible, and thereby reduce the multitude into the condition of war, contrary to the end for which all sovereignty is instituted. And therefore, as it is absurd to think that a sovereign assembly, inviting the people of their dominion to send up their deputies with power to make known their advice or desires, should therefore hold such deputies, rather than themselves, for the absolute representative of the people. So it is absurd also to think the same in a monarchy. And I know not how this, so manifest a truth, should of late be so little observed, that in a monarchy he that had the sovereignty from a descent of six hundred years was alone called sovereign, had the title of majesty from every one of his subjects, and was unquestionably taken by them for their king was notwithstanding never considered as their representative. That name without contradiction passing for the title of those men which at his command were sent up by the people to carry their petitions, and give him, if he permitted it, their advice, which may serve as an admonition for those that are the true and absolute representative of a people, to instruct men in the nature of that office, and to take heed how they admit of any other general representation upon any occasion whatsoever if they mean to discharge the trust committed to them. The difference between these three kinds of commonwealth consisteth not in the difference of power, but in the difference of convenience or aptitude to produce the peace and security of the people, for which end they were instituted. And to compare monarchy with the other two we may observe, first, that whosoever beareth the person of the people, or is one of that assembly that bears it, beareth also his own natural person. And though he be careful in his politic person to procure the common interest, 
yet he is more, or no less, careful to procure the private good of himself, his family, kindred, and friends. And for the most part, if the public interest chance to cross the private, he prefers the private, for the passions of man are commonly more potent than their reason. From whence it follows that where the public and private interest are most closely united, there is the public most advanced. Now, in monarchy, the private interest is the same with the public. The riches, power, and honour of a monarch arise only from the riches, strength, and reputation of his subjects. For no king can be rich, nor glorious, nor secure, whose subjects are either poor, or contemptible, or too weak through want, or dissension, to maintain a war against their enemies. Whereas, in a democracy, or aristocracy, the public prosperity confers not so much to the private fortune of one that is corrupt or ambitious, as doth many times a perfidious advice, a treacherous action, or a civil war. Secondly, that a monarch receiveth counsel of whom, when, and where he pleaseth, and consequently may hear the opinion of men versed in the matter about which he deliberates, of what rank or quality soever, and as long before the time of action and with as much secrecy as he will. But when a sovereign assembly has need of counsel, none are admitted but such as have a right thereto from the beginning, which for the most part are of those who have been versed more in the acquisition of wealth than of knowledge, and are to give their advice in long discourses which may, and do commonly, excite men to action, but not govern them in it. For the understanding is by the flame of the passions never enlightened, but dazzled, nor is there any place or time wherein an assembly can receive counsel secretly, because of their own multitude. Thirdly, that the resolutions of a monarch are subject to no other inconstancy than that of human nature, but in assemblies, besides that of nature, there ariseth an inconstancy from the number, for the absence of a few that would have the resolution, once taken, continue firm, which may happen by security, negligence, or private impediments, or the diligent appearance of a few of the contrary opinion, undoes to-day all that was concluded yesterday. Fourthly, that a monarch cannot disagree with himself out of envy or interest, but an assembly may, and that to such a height as may produce a civil war. Fifthly, that in monarchy there is this inconvenience, that any subject, by the power of one man, for the enriching of a favourite or flatterer, may be deprived of all he possesseth, which I confess is a great and inevitable inconvenience. But the same may as well happen where the sovereign power is in an assembly, for their power is the same, and they are as subject to evil counsel, and to be seduced by orators, as a monarch by flatterers and becoming one another's flatterers, serve one another's covetousness and ambition by turns. And whereas the favourites of monarchs are few, and they have none else to advance but their own kindred, the favourites of an assembly are many, and the kindred much more numerous than of any monarch. Besides, there is no favourite of a monarch which cannot as well succour his friends as hurt his enemies. But orators, that is to say, favourites of sovereign assemblies, though they have great powers to hurt, have little to save. For to accuse requires less eloquence, such is man's nature, than to excuse. And condemnation, than absolution, more resembles justice. Sixthly, that it is an inconvenience in monarchy that the sovereignty may descend upon an infant, or one that cannot discern between good and evil, and consisteth in this that the use of his power must be in the hand of another man, or of some assembly of men, which are to govern by his right, and in his name, as curators and protectors of his person and authority. But to say there is inconvenience in putting the use of the sovereign power into the hand of a man, or an assembly of men, is to say that all government is more inconvenient than confusion and civil war and therefore all the danger that can be pretended must arise from the contention of those that for an office of so great honour and profit may become competitors to make it appear that this inconvenience proceeded not from that form of government we call monarchy 
we are to consider that the precedent monarch hath appointed who shall have the tuition of his infant successor, either expressly by testament, or tacitly by not controlling the custom in that case received. And then such inconvenience, if it happen, is to be attributed not to the monarchy, but to the ambition and injustice of the subjects, which in all kinds of government, where the people are not well instructed in their duty and the rights of sovereignty, is the same. Or else the precedent monarch hath not at all taken order for such tuition, and then the law of nature hath provided this sufficient rule, that the tuition shall be in him that hath by nature most interest in the preservation of the authority of the infant, and to whom least benefit can accrue by his death or diminution. For seeing every man by nature seeketh his own benefit and promotion, to put an infant into the power of those that can promote themselves by his destruction or damage is not tuition, but treachery. So that sufficient provision being taken against all just quarrel about the government under a child, if any contention arise to the disturbance of the public peace, it is not to be attributed to the form of monarchy, but to the ambition of subjects and ignorance of their duty. On the other side, there is no great commonwealth, the sovereignty whereof is in a great assembly, which is not, as to consultations of peace and war and making of laws, in the same condition as if the government were in a child. For as a child wants the judgment to dissent from counsel given him, and is thereby necessitated to take the advice of them or him to whom he is committed, so an assembly wanted the liberty to dissent from the counsel of the major part, be it good or bad. And as a child has need of a tutor or protector to preserve his person and authority, so also in great commonwealths the sovereign assembly, in all great dangers and troubles, have need of custodes libertatis, that is, of dictators or protectors of their authority, which are as much as temporary monarchs to whom for a time they may commit the entire exercise of their power, and have, at the end of that time, been oftener deprived thereof than infant kings by their protectors, regents, or any other tutors. Though the kinds of sovereignty be, as I have now shown, but three, that is to say, monarchy, where one man has it, or democracy, where the general assembly of subjects has it, or aristocracy, where it is in an assembly of certain persons nominated or otherwise distinguished from the rest, yet he that shall consider the particular commonwealths that have been and are in the world will not perhaps easily reduce them to three, and may thereby be inclined to think there be other forms arising from these mingled together, as for example elective kingdoms, where kings have the sovereign power put into their hands for a time, or kingdoms wherein the king hath a power limited, which governments are nevertheless by most writers called monarchy. Likewise, if a popular or aristocratical commonwealth subdue an enemy's country, and govern the same by a president, procurator, or other magistrate, this may seem perhaps at first sight to be a democratical or aristocratical government, but it is not so. For elective kings are not sovereigns, but ministers of the sovereign, nor limited kings sovereigns, but ministers of them that have the sovereign power, nor are those provinces which are in subjection to a democracy or aristocracy of another commonwealth, democratically or aristocratically governed, but monarchically. And first, concerning an elective king whose power is limited to his life, as it is in many places of Christendom at this day, or to certain years or months, as the dictator's power amongst the Romans, if he have right to appoint his successor, he is no more elective, but hereditary. But if he have no power to elect his successor, then there is some other man, or assembly, known, which after his decease may elect a new, or else the commonwealth dieth, or dissolveth with him, and returneth to the condition of war. If it be known who have the power to give the sovereignty after his death, it is known also that the sovereignty was in them before. For none have right to give that which they have not right to possess, and keep to themselves if they think good. But if there be none that can give the sovereignty after the decease of him that was first elected, then has he power, nay, he is obliged by the law of nature, to provide, by establishing a successor, 
to keep to those that had trusted him with the government from relapsing into the miserable condition of civil war. And consequently he was, when elected, a sovereign absolute. Secondly, that king whose power is limited is not superior to him or them that have the power to limit it, and he that is not superior is not supreme, that is to say, not sovereign. The sovereignty, therefore, was always in that assembly which had the right to limit him, and by consequence the government, not monarchy, but either democracy or aristocracy, as of all times in Sparta, where the kings had a privilege to lead their armies, but the sovereignty was in the ephori. Thirdly, whereas heretofore the Roman people governed the land of Judea, for example, by a president, yet was not Judea therefore a democracy, because they were not governed by any assembly into which any of them had right to enter, nor by an aristocracy, because they were not governed by any assembly into which any man could enter by their election. But they were governed by one person, which, though as to the people of Rome was an assembly of the people, or democracy, yet as to the people of Judea, which had no right at all of participating in the government, was a monarch. For though where the people are governed by an assembly, chosen by themselves out of their own number, the government is called a democracy, or aristocracy, yet when they are governed by an assembly not of their own choosing, it is a monarchy, not of one man over another man, but of one people over another people. Of all these forms of government, the matter being mortal, so that not only monarchs but also whole assemblies die, it is necessary for the conservation of the peace of men that, as there was order taken for an artificial man, so there be order also taken for an artificial eternity of life, without which men that are governed by an assembly should return into the condition of war in every age, and they that are governed by one man as soon as their governor dieth. This artificial eternity is that which men call the right of succession. There is no perfect form of government where the disposing of the succession is not in the present sovereign. For if it be in any other particular man or private assembly, it is in a person subject, and may be assumed by the sovereign at his pleasure, and consequently the right is in himself. And if it be in no particular man, but left to a new choice, then is the commonwealth dissolved and the right is in him that can get it, contrary to the intention of them that did institute the commonwealth for their perpetual, and not temporary, security. In a democracy the whole assembly cannot fail, unless the multitude that are to be governed fail, and therefore questions of the right of succession have in that form of government no place at all. In an aristocracy, when any of the assembly dieth, the election of another into his room belonged to the assembly, as the sovereign to whom belongeth the choosing of all counsellors and officers. For that which the representative doth as actor, every one of the subjects doth as author. And though the sovereign assembly may give power to others to elect new men, for supply of their court, yet it is still by their authority that the election is made, and by the same it may, when the public shall require it, be recalled. The greatest difficulty about the right of succession is in monarchy and the difficulty ariseth from this, that at first sight it is not manifest who is to appoint the successor, nor many times who it is whom he hath appointed. For in both these cases there is required a more exact ratiocination than every man is accustomed to use. As to the question who shall appoint the successor of a monarch that hath the sovereign authority, that is to say, who shall determine of the right of inheritance, for elective kings and princes have not the sovereign power in propriety, but in use only, we are to consider that either he that is in possession has right to dispose of the succession, or else that right is again in the dissolved multitude. For the death of him that hath the sovereign power and property leaves the multitude without any sovereign at all, that is, without any representative in whom they should be united, and be capable of doing any one action at all and therefore they are incapable of election of any new monarch, every man having equal right to submit himself to such as he thinks best able to protect him, or, if he can, protect himself by his own sword, which is a return to confusion, and to the condition of a war of every man against every man, contrary to the end for which monarchy had its first institution. 
Therefore it is manifest that by the institution of monarchy the disposing of the successor is always left to the judgment and will of the present possessor. And for the question which may arise sometimes, who it is that the monarch in possession hath designed to the succession and inheritance of his power, it is determined by his express words and testament, or by other tacit signs sufficient. By express words or testament, when it is declared by him in his lifetime, viva voce, or by writing, as the first emperors of Rome declared who should be their heirs. For the word heir does not of itself imply the children or nearest kindred of a man, but whomsoever a man shall any way declare he would have to succeed him in his estate. If, therefore, a monarch declare expressly that such a man shall be his heir, either by word or writing, then is that man, immediately after the decease of his predecessor, invested in the right of being monarch. But where testament and express words are wanting, other natural signs of the will are to be followed, whereof the one is custom. And therefore, where the custom is that the next of kindred absolutely succeedeth, there also the next of kindred hath right to the succession. For that, if the will of him that was in possession had been otherwise, he might easily have declared the same in his lifetime. And likewise, where the custom is that the next of the male kindred succeedeth, there also the right of succession is in the next of the kindred male, for the same reason. And so it is, if the custom were to advance the female. For whatsoever custom a man may by a word control and does not, it is a natural sign he would have that custom stand. But where neither custom nor testament hath proceeded, there it is to be understood, first, that a monarch's will is that the government remain monarchical, because he hath approved that government in himself. Secondly, that a child of his own, male or female, be preferred before any other, because men are presumed to be more inclined by nature to advance their own children than the children of other men, and of their own rather a male than a female, because men are naturally fitter than women for actions of labour and danger. Thirdly, where his own issue faileth, rather a brother than a stranger, and so still the nearer in blood rather than the more remote, because it is always presumed that the nearer of kin is the nearer in affection, and it is evident that a man receives always by reflection the most honour from the greatness of his nearest kindred. But if it be lawful for a monarch to dispose of the succession by words of contract or testament, Man may perhaps object a great inconvenience, for he may sell or give his right of governing to a stranger, which, because strangers, that is, men not used to live under the same government, nor speaking the same language, do commonly undervalue one another, may turn to the oppression of his subjects, which is indeed a great inconvenience. But it proceeded not necessarily from the subjection to a stranger's government, but from the unskilfulness of the governors ignorant of the true rules of politics. And therefore the Romans, when they had subdued many nations to make their government digestible, were wont to take away that grievance as much as they thought necessary, by giving sometimes to whole nations, and sometimes to principal men of every nation they conquered, not only the privileges, but also the name of Romans, and took many of them into the senate, and offices of charge, even in the Roman city. And this was it our most wise king, King James, aimed at in endeavouring the union of his two realms of England and Scotland, which, if he could have obtained, had in all likelihood prevented the civil wars which make both those kingdoms at this present miserable. It is not, therefore, any injury to the people, for a monarch to dispose of the succession by will, though by the fault of many princes, it hath been sometimes found inconvenient. Of the lawfulness of it, this also is in argument, that whatsoever inconvenience can arrive by giving a kingdom to a stranger, may arrive also by so marrying with strangers, as the right of succession may descend upon them. Yet this by all men is accounted lawful. End of chapter 19
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter 20. Of Dominion Paternal and Despotical. A commonwealth by acquisition is that where the sovereign power is acquired by force, and it is acquired by force when men singly, or many together by plurality of voices, for fear of death or bonds, do authorize all actions of that man or assembly that hath their lives and liberty in his power. And this kind of dominion, or sovereignty, differeth from sovereignty by institution only in this, that men who choose their sovereign do it for fear of one another, and not of him whom they institute. But in this case they subject themselves to him they are afraid of. In both cases they do it for fear, which is to be noted by them that hold all such covenants, and proceed from fear of death or violence void, which, if it were true, no man in any commonwealth could be obliged to obedience. It is true that in a commonwealth once instituted or acquired, promises proceeding from fear of death or violence are no covenants, nor obliging, when the thing promised is contrary to the laws. But the reason is not because it was made upon fear, but because he that promiseth hath no right in the thing promised. Also, when he may lawfully perform, and doth not, it is not in the invalidity of the covenant that absolveth him, but the sentence of the sovereign. Otherwise, whensoever a man lawfully promiseth, he unlawfully breaketh. But when the sovereign, who is the actor, acquitteth him, then he is acquitted by him that extorted the promise, as by the author of such absolution. But the rights and consequences of sovereignty are the same in both. His power cannot, without his consent, be transferred to another. He cannot forfeit it. He cannot be accused by any of his subjects of injury. He cannot be punished by them. He is judge of what is necessarily for peace, and judge of doctrines. He is sole legislator, and supreme judge of controversies, and of the times and occasions of war and peace. To him it belongs to choose magistrates, counselors, commanders, and all other officers and ministers, and to determine of rewards and punishments, honor and order. The reasons whereof are the same, which are alleged in the precedent chapter, for the same rights and consequences of sovereignty by institution. Dominion is acquired in two ways, by generation and by conquest. The right of the dominion by generation is that which the parent hath over his children, and is called paternal, and is not so derived from the generation, as if therefore the parent had dominion over his child because he begat him, but from the child's consent, either by express or by sufficient arguments declared. For as to the generation, God hath ordained to man a helper, and there be always two that are equally parents. The dominion therefore over the child should belong equally to both, and he be equally subject to both, which is impossible, for no man can obey two masters. And whereas some have attributed the dominion of man only, as being of the more excellent sex, they misreckon it. For there is not always that difference of strength or prudence between the man and the woman, as that right can be determined without war. In commonwealths this controversy is decided by the civil law, and for the most part, but not always, the sentence is in favor of the father, because for the most part commonwealths have been erected by fathers, not by the mothers of families. But the question lieth now in the state of mere nature, where there are supposed no laws of matrimony, no laws for the education of children, but the law of nature, and the natural inclination of the sexes, one to another, and to their children. In this condition of mere nature, either the parents between themselves dispose of the dominion over the child by contract, or do not dispose thereof at all. If they dispose thereof, the right passeth according to the contract. We find in history that the Amazons contracted with the men of neighboring countries to whom they had recourse for issue, that the issue male should be sent back, but the female remain with themselves so that the dominion of the females was in the mother. If there be no contract, the dominion is in the mother, for in the condition of mere nature, where there are no matrimonial laws, it cannot be known who is the father unless it be declared by the mother. 
and therefore the right of dominion over the child dependeth on her will, and is consequently hers. Again, seeing the infant is first in the power of the mother, so as she may either nourish or expose it, if she nourish it, she owneth its life to the mother, and is therefore obliged to obey her rather than any other, and by consequence the dominion over it is hers. But if she expose it, and another find and nourish it, dominion is in him that nourish it. For it ought to obey him by whom it is preserved, because preservation of life, being the end for which one man becomes subject to another, every man is supposed to promise obedience to him in whose power it is to save or destroy him. If the mother be the father's subject, the child is in the father's power, and if the father be in the mother's subject, as when a sovereign queen marrieth one of her subjects, the child is subject to the mother, because the father also is her subject. If a man and woman, monarchs of two several kingdoms, have a child, in contract concerning who shall have dominion of him, the right of dominion passeth by contract. If they contract not, the dominion followeth the dominion of the place of his residence. For the sovereign of each country hath dominion over all that reside therein. He that hath dominion over the child hath dominion also over the children of the child, and over their children's children. For he that hath dominion over the person of a man hath dominion over all that is his, without which dominion were but a title without effect. The right of succession to paternal dominion proceedeth in the same manner as doth the right of succession of monarchy, of which I have already sufficiently spoken in the preceding chapter. Dominion acquired by conquest, or in victory in war, is that which some writers call despotical from despotes, which signifieth a lord or master, and is dominion of the master over his servant. And this dominion is then acquired to the victor when the vanquished, to avoid the present stroke of death, coveteth, either in the express words or by the other sufficient signs of the will, so long as his life, and the liberty of his body, alloweth him. The victor shall have the use thereof at his pleasure. And after such covenant made, the vanquished is a servant, and not before. For the word servant, whether it be derived from servere, to serve, or from servere, to save, which I leave to grammarians to dispute, is not meant a captive, which is kept in prison, or bonds, till the owner of him that took him, or bought him if one that did, shall consider what to do with him. For such men, commonly called slaves, have no obligation at all, but may break their bonds, or the prison, and kill, or carry away captive their matter, justly. But one that, being taken, hath corporal liberty allowed him, and upon promise not to run away, nor to do violence to his master, is trusted by him. It is not, therefore, the victory that giveth the dominion over the vanquished, but his own covenant. Nor is he obliged, because he is conquered, that is to say, beaten, or taken, or put to flight, but because he cometh in, and submitteth to the victor nor is the victor obliged by an enemy's rendering himself, without promise of life, to spare him, for this, his yielding to discretion, which obliges not the victor longer than in his own discretion he shall think of it. And that which men do when they demand, as is now called quarter, which the Greeks called zagria, taking life, is to evade the present fury of the victor by submission, and to compound for their life with ransom or service. And therefore he that hath quarter hath not his life given, but deferred, till further deliberation. For it is not a yielding on condition of life, but to discretion. And then only is his life in security, as his service due, when the victor hath trusted him with his corporal liberty. For slaves that work in prisons, or fetters, do it not of duty, but to avoid the cruelty of their taskmasters. The master of the servant is also master of all that he hath, and may exact the use thereof. That is to say, of his goods, of his labor, of his servants, and of his children, as often as he shall think fit. For he beholdeth his life of his master by the covenant of obedience, that is, of owning and authorizing whatsoever the master shall do. And in the case of the master, if he refuse, kill him, or cast him into bonds, or otherwise punish him for his disobedience, he is himself the author of the same, and cannot accuse him of injury. In sum, the rights and consequences of both paternal and despotical dominion are the very same with those of a sovereign by institution. 
and for the same reasons, which reasons are set down in the preceding chapter. So that for a man that is monarch of diverse nations, he hath in one the sovereignty by institution of the people assembled, and in another by conquest, that is, by the submission of each particular, to avoid death or bonds, to demand of one nation more than of another, from the title of conquest, as being a conquered nation, is an act of ignorance of the rights of the sovereignty. For the sovereign is absolute over both alike. Or else there is no sovereignty at all, and so every man may lawfully protect himself, if he can, with his own sword, which is the condition of war. By this it appears that a great family, if it be not part of some commonwealth, is of itself, as to the rights of sovereignty, a little monarchy. Whether that family consist of a man and his children, or of a man and his servants, or of a man and his children and servants together, wherein the father or master is the sovereign. But yet a family is not properly a commonwealth, unless it be of that power by its own number, or by other opportunities, as not to be subdued without hazard of war. For where a number of men are manifestly too weak to defend themselves united, every one may use his own reason in time of danger to save his own life, either by flight or by submission to the enemy, as he shall think best. And in the same manner, as a very small company of soldiers, surprised by an army, may cast down their arms and demand quarter or run away, than be put to the sword. And thus much shall suffice concerning what I find by speculation and deduction of sovereign rights from their nature, need, and designs of men in erecting of commonwealths, and putting themselves under monarchs, or assemblies entrusted with power enough for their protection. Let us now consider what the scripture teacheth in the same point. To Moses the children of Israel say thus, Speak thou to us, and we will hear thee. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. Exodus 20.19 this is absolute obedience to Moses. Concerning the right of kings, God himself, by the mouth of Samuel, saith, This shall be the right of the king you will have to reign over you. He shall take your sons, and set them to drive his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots, and gather in his harvest, and to make his engines of war, and instruments of his chariots, and shall take your daughters to make perfumes, to be his cooks and bakers, he shall take your fields, your vineyards, and your olive-yards, and give them to his servants. He shall take the tithe of your corn and wine, and give it to the men of his chamber and his other servants. He shall take your manservants and your maidservants, and the choice of your youth, and employ them in his business. He shall take the tithe of your flocks, and you shall be his servants. 1 Samuel 8, 11-17 this is absolute power, and summed up in the last words, You shall be his servants. Again, when the people heard what power their king was to have, yet they consented thereto, and say thus, We will be as all other nations, and our king shall judge our causes, and go before us, and conduct our wars. The same, 8, 19, 20. Here is confirmed the right that sovereigns have, both to the militia and to all judicature, in which is contained an absolute power as one man can possibly transfer to another. Again, the prayer of King Solomon to God was this, Give thy servant understanding to judge thy people and to discern between good and evil. 1 Kings 3 9 It belonged, therefore, to the sovereign to be judge, and to prescribe the rules of discerning good and evil, which rules are laws, and therefore in him is legislative power. Saul sought the life of David. Yet when it was in his power to slay Saul, and his servants would have done it, David forbade them. Saul sought the life of David. Yet when it was in his power to slay Saul, and his servants would have done it, David forbade them, saying, God forbid I should do such an act against my Lord, the anointed of God. 1 Samuel 24, 6 For obedience of servants, St. Paul saith, Servants obey your masters in all things. Colossians 3, 22 And children obey your parents in all things. The same, 3, 20 
there is simple obedience in those that are subject to paternal or despotical dominion. Again, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses's chair, and therefore all that they shall bid you observe, that observe and do. Matthew 23, 2, 3 there again is simple obedience and st paul warn them that they subject themselves to princes and to those that are in authority and obey them titus three one this obedience is also simple lastly our saviour himself acknowledges that men ought to pay such taxes as are by kings imposed where he says give to caesar what is caesar's and paid such taxes himself and that the king's word is sufficient to take anything from any subject, when there is need, and that the king is judge of that need, for he himself, as the king of the Jews, commanded his disciples to take the ass and ass's colt, to carry him into Jerusalem, saying, Go into the village over against you, and you shall find a she-ass tied, and her colt with her, untie them, and bring them to me. And if any man ask you what you mean by it, Say, The Lord hath need of them, and they will let them go. Matthew 21, 2-3 They will not ask whether his necessity be a sufficient title, nor whether he be judge of that necessity, but acquiescence in the will of the Lord. To these places may be added also that of Genesis. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3-5 And who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? The same. 3.11 For the cognizance or judicature of good and evil, being forbidden by the name of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, as a trial of Adam's obedience, the devil to inflame the ambition of the woman, to whom that fruit already seemed beautiful, told her that by tasting it they should be as gods, knowing good and evil whereupon having both eaten they did indeed take upon them god's office which is judicature of good and evil but acquired no new ability to distinguish between them aright and whereas it is said that having eaten they saw they were naked no man hath so interpreted that place as if they had been formidably blind and saw not their own skins the meaning is plain that it was then they first judged their nakedness wherein it was God's will to create them, to be uncomely. And by being ashamed did tacitly censure God himself. And thereupon God saith, Hast thou eaten, etc.? As if he should say, Dost thou that owest me obedience take upon thee to judge of my commandments? Whereby it is clearly, though allegorically, signified that the commands of them that have the right to command are not by their subjects to be censured or disputed. So that it appeareth plainly to my understanding, both from reason and scripture, that sovereign power, whether placed in one man, as in monarchy, or in one assembly of men, as in popular and aristocratical commonwealth, is as great a possibility men can be imagined to make it. And though of so unlimited a power, men may fancy many evil consequences, yet the consequences of the want of it, which is perpetual war of every man against his neighbor, are much worse. The condition of man in this life shall never be without inconveniences, but there happeneth in no commonwealth any great inconvenience but what proceeds from the subject's disobedience and breach of those covenants from which the commonwealth has its beginning. And whosoever, thinking sovereign power too great, will seek to make it less, must subject himself to the power that can limit it, that is to say, to a greater. The greatest objection is that of the practice. When men ask where and when such power has by subjects been acknowledged. But one may ask them again, when or where has there been a kingdom long free from sedition and civil war? In those nations whose commonwealths have been long lived, and not been destroyed but by foreign war, and subjects never did dispute of the sovereign power, in those nations which commonwealths have been long lived and not been destroyed but by foreign war, the subjects never did dispute of the sovereign power. But howsoever, 
an argument from the practice of men that have not sifted to the bottom and with exact reason weighted the causes in nature of commonwealths and suffered daily those miseries that proceeded from the ignorance thereof is invalid for though in all places of the world men should lay the foundation of their houses on the sand it could not thence be inferred that so it ought to be the skill of making and maintaining commonwealths consisteth in certain rules as doth arithmetic and geometry not as tennis play on practice only which rules neither poor men had the leisure nor men that have had the leisure have hitherto had the curiosity or the method to find out end of chapter twenty recorded by nikki sullivan chicago of leviathan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recorded by kirsten ferrari leviathan by thomas hobbes chapter 21 of the liberty of subjects liberty what liberty or freedom signifieth properly the absence of opposition by opposition I mean external impediments of motion, and may be applied no less to irrational and inanimate creatures than to rational. For whatsoever is so tied or environed as it cannot move but within a certain space, which space is determined by the opposition of some external body, we say it hath not liberty to go further. And so of all living creatures, whilst they are imprisoned or restrained with walls or chains, and of the water whilst it is kept in by banks or vessels that otherwise would spread itself into a larger space, we used to say, they are not at liberty to move in such a manner, as without those external impediments they would. But when the impediment of motion is in the constitution of the thing itself, we use not to say, it wants the liberty, but the power to move, as when a stone lieth still, or a man is fastened to his bed by sickness. WHAT IT IS TO BE FREE And according to this proper, and generally received meaning of the word, a free man is he that in those things which by his strength and wit he is able to do, is not hindered to do what he has will to. But when the words free and liberty are applied to anything but bodies, they are abused, for that which is not subject to motion is not subject to impediment. And therefore, when tis said, for example, the way is free, no liberty of the way is signified, but of those that walk in it without stop. And when we say a gift is free, there is not meant any liberty of the gift, but of the giver, that was not bound by any law or covenant to give it. So when we speak freely, it is not the liberty of voice or pronunciation, but of the man whom no law hath obliged to speak otherwise than he did. Lastly, from the use of the word free will, no liberty can be inferred to the will, desire, or inclination, but the liberty of the man, which consisteth in this, that he finds no stop in doing what he has the will, desire, or inclination to do. Fear and Liberty Consistent Fear and liberty are consistent, as when a man throweth his goods into the sea, for fear the ship should sink, he doth it nevertheless very willingly, and may refuse to do it if he will. It is therefore the action of one that was free, so a man sometimes pays his debt only for fear of imprisonment, which because nobody hindered him from detaining, was the action of a man at liberty. And generally all actions men do in common wealths for fear of the law, or actions which the doers had liberty to omit. Liberty and Necessity Consistent Liberty and necessity are consistent, as in the water that hath not only liberty, but a necessity of descending by the channel. So likewise, in the actions which men voluntarily do, which, because they proceed from their will, proceed from liberty, and yet because every act of man's will, and every desire and inclination proceedeth from some cause, which causes in a continual chain, whose first link in the hand of the God the first of all causes, proceed from necessity so that to him that could see the connection of those causes, the necessity of all men's voluntary actions would appear manifest. And therefore God, that seeth and disposeth all things, 
seeth also that the liberty of man in doing what he will is accompanied with the necessity of doing that which god will and no more nor less for though men may do many things which god does not command nor is therefore author of them yet they can have no passion nor appetite to anything of which appetite god's will is not the cause and did not his will assure the necessity of man's will and consequently of all that on man's will dependeth the liberty of man would be a contradiction and impediment to the omnipotence and liberty of god and this shall suffice as to the matter in hand of that natural liberty which only properly is called liberty artificial bonds or covenants but as men for the attaining of peace and conservation of themselves thereby have made an artificial man which we call a commonwealth so also have they made artificial chains called civil laws which they themselves by mutual covenants have fastened at one end to the lips of that man or assembly to whom they have given the sovereign power and at the other end to their own ears these bonds in their own nature but weak may nevertheless be made to hold by the danger though not by the difficulty of breaking them liberty of subjects consisteth of liberty from covenants in relation to these bonds only it is that i am to speak now of the liberty of subjects for seeing there is no commonwealth in the world for the regulating of all the actions and words of men as being a thing impossible it followeth necessarily that in all kinds of actions by the laws pretermitted men have the liberty of doing what their own reason shall suggest for the most profitable to themselves for if we take liberty in the proper sense for corporal liberty, that is to say freedom from chains and prison, it were very absurd for men to clamour as they do for liberty they so manifestly enjoy. Again, if we take liberty for an exemption from laws, it is no less absurd for men to demand as they do that liberty by which all other men may be masters of their lives. And yet as absurd as it is, this is it they demand, not knowing that the laws are of no power to protect them without a sword in the hands of a man or men to cause those laws to be put in execution. The liberty of a subject lieth therefore only in those things which in regulating their actions the sovereign hath pretermitted, such as is the liberty to buy and sell, and otherwise contract with one another, to choose their own abode, their own diet, their own trade of life, and institute their children as they themselves think fit, and the like. Liberty of the subject, consistent with the unlimited power of the sovereign. Nevertheless, we are not to understand that by such liberty the sovereign power of life and death is either abolished or limited. For it has already been shown that nothing the sovereign representative can do to a subject, on what pretense soever, can properly be called injustice or injury, because every subject is author of every act the sovereign doth so that he never wanteth right to anything otherwise than as he himself is the subject of god and bound thereby to observe the laws of nature and therefore it may and doth often happen in common wells that a subject may be put to death by the command of the sovereign power and yet neither do the other wrong as when jephthah caused his daughter to be sacrificed in which and the like cases he that so dieth hath liberty to do the action for which he is nevertheless without injury put to death and the same holdeth also in a sovereign prince that putteth to death an innocent subject for though the action be against the law of nature as being contrary to equity as was the killing of uriah by david yet it was not an injury to uriah but to god not to uriah because the right to do what he pleased was given him by uriah himself and yet to god because david was god's subject and prohibited all iniquity by the law of nature which distinction David himself, when he repented the fact, evidently confirmed, saying, To thee only have I sinned. In the same manner the people of Athens, when they banished the most potent of their commonwealth for ten years, thought they had committed no injustice, and yet they never questioned what crime he had done, but what hurt he would do. Nay, they commanded the banishment of they knew not whom, and every citizen, bringing his oyster-shell into the market-place, written with the name of him he desired should be banished, without actual accusing him, sometime banished an Aristides for his reputation of justice, and sometimes a scurrilous jester as hyperbolus to make a jest of it. And yet a man cannot say the sovereign people of Athens wanted right to banish them, or an Athenian the liberty to jest, or to be just." The liberty which writers praise is the liberty of sovereigns, not of private men. The liberty, 
whereof there is so frequent and honourable mention in the histories and philosophy of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and in the writings and discourse of those that from them have received all their learning in the politics, is not the liberty of particular men, but the liberty of the common wealth, which is the same with that which every man then should have, if there were no civil laws nor common wealth at all. And the effects of it also be the same. For as among masterless men there is perpetual war of every man against his neighbour, no inheritance to transmit to the son, nor to expect from the father, no propriety of goods or lands, no security, but a full and absolute liberty in every man, so in states and commonwealths not dependent on one another, every commonwealth, not every man, has an absolute liberty to do what it shall judge, that is to say, what that man or assembly that representeth it shall judge, most conducing to their benefit. But withal, they live in the condition of a perpetual war, and upon the confines of battle, with their frontiers armed and cannons planted against their neighbours round about. The Athenians and Romans were free, that is, free commonwealths, not that any particular men had the liberty to resist their own representative, but that their representative had the liberty to resist or invade other people. There is written on the turrets of the city of Lucca in great characters at this day the word libertas. Yet no man can thence infer that a particular man has more liberty or immunity from the service of the commonwealth there than in Constantinople. Whether a commonwealth be monarchical or popular, the freedom is still the same. But it is an easy thing for men to be deceived by the specious name of liberty, and for want of judgment to distinguish, mistake that for their private inheritance and birthright which is the right of the public only. And when the same error is conferred by the authority of men in reputation for their writings in this subject, it is no wonder if it produce sedition and change of government. In these western parts of the world we are made to receive our opinions concerning the institution and rights of commonwealths from Aristotle, Cicero, and other men, Greeks and Romans, that living under popular states derived those rights not from the principles of nature, but transcribed them into their books, out of the practice of their own commonwealths which were popular, as the grammarians described the rules of language out of the practice of the time, or the rules of poetry out of the poems of Homer and Virgil. And because the Athenians were taught, to keep them from desire of changing their government, that they were freemen, and all that lived under monarchy were slaves, therefore Aristotle puts it down in his Politics, Book 6, Chapter 2. In democracy liberty is to be supposed, for it is commonly held that no man is free in any other government. End quote. And as Aristotle, so Cicero, and other writers have grounded their civil doctrine on the opinions of the Romans, who were taught to hate monarchy at first by them that, having deposed their sovereign, shared amongst them the sovereignty of Rome, and afterwards by their successors. And by reading of these Greek and Latin authors, men from their childhood have gotten the habit, under a false show of liberty, of favouring tumults, and of licentious controlling the actions of their sovereigns, and again of controlling those controllers, with the effusion of so much blood, as I think I may truly say, there was never anything so dearly bought as these western parts have bought the learning of the Greek and Latin tongues. Liberty of the Subject How to be Measured to come now to the particulars of the true liberty of a subject, that is to say, what are the things which, though commanded by the sovereign, he may nevertheless without injustice refuse to do, we are to consider what rights we pass away when we make a common wealth, or, which is all one, what liberty we deny ourselves by owning all the actions without exception of the man or assembly we make our sovereign. For in the act of our submission consisteth both our obligation and our liberty, which must therefore be inferred by arguments taken from thence, there being no obligation on any man which ariseth not from some act of his own, for all men equally are by nature free. And because such arguments must either be drawn from the express words, I authorize all his actions, or from the intention of him that submitteth himself to his power, which intention is to be understood by the end for which he so submitteth, the obligation and liberty of the subject is to be derived either from those words or others equivalent, or else from the end of the institution of sovereignty, namely, the peace of the subjects within themselves, and their defence against a common enemy. Subjects have liberty to defend their own bodies, even against them that lawfully invade them. 
First, therefore, seeing sovereignty by institution is by covenant of every one to every one, and sovereignty by acquisition, by covenants of the vanquished to the victor, or child to the parent, it is manifest that every subject has liberty in all those things, the right whereof cannot by covenant be transferred. I have shown before in the fourteenth chapter that covenants, not to defend a man's own body, are void. Therefore, if the sovereign command a man, though justly condemned, to kill, wound, or maim himself, or not to resist those that assault him, or to abstain from the use of food, air, medicine, or any other thing without which he cannot live, yet hath that man the liberty to disobey. Again, if a man be interrogated by the sovereign or his authority concerning a crime done by himself, he is not bound without assurance of pardon to confess it, because no man, as I have shown in the same chapter, can be obliged by covenant to accuse himself. Again, the consent of a subject to sovereign power is contained in these words, I authorize or take upon me all his actions, in which there is no restriction at all of his former natural liberty. For by allowing him to kill me, I am not bound to kill myself when he commands me. Tis one thing to say, Kill me or my fellow, if you please. Another thing to say, I will kill myself or my fellow. It followeth, therefore, that no man is bound by the words themselves either to kill himself or any other man, and consequently that the obligation a man may sometimes have upon the command of the sovereign to execute any dangerous or dishonorable office dependeth not on the words of our submission, but on the intention, which is to be understood by the end thereof. When, therefore, our refusal to obey frustrates the end for which the sovereignty was ordained, then there is no liberty to refuse. Otherwise, there is. Upon this ground, a man that is commanded, as a soldier, to fight against the enemy, though his sovereign have right enough to punish his refusal with death, may nevertheless in many cases refuse without injustice, as when he substituteth a sufficient soldier in his place for in this case he deserteth not the service of the commonwealth. And there is allowance to be made for natural timorousness, not only to women, of whom no such dangerous duty is expected, but also to men of feminine courage. When armies fight, there is on one side or both a running away. Yet when they do it not out of treachery but fear, they are not esteemed to do it unjustly, but dishonorably. For the same reason to avoid battle is not injustice, but cowardice. But he that enrolleth himself a soldier, or taketh impressed money, taketh away the excuse of a timorous nature, and is obliged not only to go to the battle, but also not to run from it, without his captain's leave. And when the defence of the commonwealth requireth at once the help of all that are able to bear arms, every one is obliged, because otherwise the institution of the commonwealth, which they have not the purpose or courage to preserve, was in vain. To resist the sword of the commonwealth in defence of another man, guilty or innocent, no man hath liberty, because such liberty takes away from the sovereign the means of protecting us, and is therefore destructive of the very essence of government. But in case a great many men together have already resisted the sovereign power unjustly, or committed some capital crime for which every one of them expecteth death, whether have they not the liberty then to join together and assist, and defend one another? Certainly they have for they but defend their lives, which the guilty man may as well do as the innocent. There was indeed injustice in the first breach of their duty. Their bearing of arms subsequent to it, though it be to maintain what they have done, is no new unjust act, and if it be only to defend their persons, it is not unjust at all. But the offer of pardon taketh from them to whom it is offered the plea of self-defence, and maketh their persevering in assisting or defending the rest unlawful. The greatest liberty of subjects dependeth on the silence of the law. As for other liberties, they depend on the silence of the law. In cases where the sovereign has prescribed no rule, there the subject hath the liberty to do or forbear according to his own discretion, and therefore such liberty is in some places more, and in some less, and in some times more, in other times less, according as they that have the sovereignty shall think most convenient. As for example, there was a time when in England a man might enter into his own land, and dispossess such as wrongfully possessed it by force. But in after times, that liberty of forcible entry was taken away by a statute made by the king in Parliament. And in some places of the world, men hath the liberty of many wives. In other places, such liberty is not allowed. 
If a subject have a controversy with his sovereign of debt, or of right of possession of lands or goods, or concerning any service required at his hands, or concerning any penalty corporal or pecuniary, grounded on a precedent law, he hath the same liberty to sue for his right as if it were against a subject, and before such judges as are appointed by the sovereign. For seeing the sovereign demandeth by force of a former law, and not by virtue of his power, he declareth thereby that he requireth no more than shall appear to be due by that law. The suit, therefore, is not contrary to the will of the sovereign, and consequently the subject hath the liberty to demand the hearing of his cause, and sentence according to that law. But if he demand or take anything by pretense of his power, there lieth in that case no action of law for all that is done by him in virtue of his power is done by the authority of every subject, and consequently he that brings an action against the sovereign brings it against himself. If a monarch or sovereign assembly grant a liberty to all, or any of his subjects, which grant standing, he is disabled to provide for their safety, the grant is void, unless he directly renounce or transfer the sovereignty to another for in that he might openly, if it had been his will, and in plain terms, have renounced or transferred it, and did not. It is to be understood it was not his will, but that the grant proceeded from ignorance of the repugnancy between such a liberty and the sovereign power, and therefore the sovereignty is still retained, and consequently all those powers which are necessary to the exercising thereof, such as the power of war and peace, of judicature, of appointing officers and counsellors, of levying money, and the rest named in the eighteenth chapter. In what cases subjects are absolved of their obedience to their sovereign? The obligation of subjects to the sovereign is understood to last as long, and no longer, than the power lasteth, by which he is able to protect them. For the right men have by nature to protect themselves, when none else can protect them, can by no covenant be relinquished. The sovereignty is the soul of the commonwealth, which once departed from the body, the members do no more receive their motion from it. The end of obedience is protection, which wheresoever a man seeth it, either in his own or in another's sword, nature applieth his obedience to it, and his endeavour to maintain it. And though sovereignty in the intention of them that make it be immortal, Yet is it in its own nature not only subject to violent death by foreign war, but also through the ignorance and passions of men, it hath in it from the very institution many seeds of a natural mortality, by intestine discord. In case of captivity. If a subject be taken prisoner in war, or his person or his means of life be within the guards of the enemy, and hath his life and corporal liberty given him on condition to be subject to the victor, he hath liberty to accept the condition, and having accepted it, is the subject of him that took him, because he had no other way to preserve himself. The case is the same if he be detained in a foreign country, on the same terms. But if a man be held in prison or bonds, or is not trusted with the liberty of his body, he cannot be understood to be bound by covenant to subjection, and therefore may, if he can, make his escape by any means whatsoever. In case the sovereign cast off the government from himself and his heirs. If a monarch shall relinquish the sovereignty both for himself and his heirs, his subjects return to the absolute liberty of nature because, though nature may declare who are his sons, and who are his nearest of kin, yet it dependeth on his own will, as hath been said in the precedent chapter, who shall be his heir. If therefore he will have no heir, there is no sovereignty nor subjection. The case is the same if he die without known kindred, and without declaration of his heir. For then there can no heir be known, and consequently no subjection be due. In case of banishment. If the sovereign banish his subject, during the banishment he is not subject. But he that is sent on a message, or hath leave to travel, is still subject. But it is by contract between sovereigns, not by virtue of the covenant of subjection. For whosoever entereth into another's dominion is subject to all the laws thereof, unless he have a privilege by the amity of the sovereigns, or by special license. In case the sovereign render himself subject to another. If a monarch, subdued by war, render himself subject to the victor, his subjects are delivered from their former obligation, and become obliged to the victor. But if he be held prisoner, or have not the liberty of his own body, he is not understood to have given away the right of sovereignty, 
and therefore his subjects are obliged to yield obedience to the magistrates formerly placed, governing not in their name, but in his. For his right remaining, the question is only of the administration, that is to say, of the magistrates and officers, which, if he have not means to name, he is supposed to approve those which he himself had formerly appointed. End of chapter 21「Leviathan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes Chapter 22 Of System Subject, Political, and Private Having spoken of the generation, form, and power of a commonwealth, I am in order to speak next of the parts thereof, and first of systems, which resemble the similar parts or muscles of a body natural. By systems I understand any numbers of men joined in one interest or one business, of which some are regular and some irregular. Regular are those where one man, or assembly of men, is constituted representative of the whole number. All other are irregular. Of regular, some are absolute and independent, subject to none but their own representative. Such are only commonwealths, of which I have spoken already in the five last precedent chapters. Others are dependent, that is to say, subordinate to some sovereign power, to which every one, as also their representative, is subject. Of system subordinate, some are political, and some private. Political, otherwise called bodies politic and persons in law, are those which are made by authority from the sovereign power of the commonwealth. Private are those which are constituted by subjects among themselves, or by authority from a stranger. For no authority derived from foreign power within the dominion of another is public there, but private. And of private systems, some are lawful, some unlawful. Lawful are those which are allowed by the commonwealth. All other are unlawful. Irregular systems are those which, having no representative, consist only in concourse of people, which, if not forbidden by the commonwealth, nor made on evil design, such as our conflux of people to markets or shows or any other harmless end, are lawful. But when the intention is evil, or, if the number be considerable, unknown, they are unlawful. In bodies politic, the power of the representative is always limited, and that which prescribeth the limits thereof is the power sovereign, for power unlimited is absolute sovereignty, and the sovereign in every commonwealth is the absolute representative of all the subjects, and therefore no other can be representative of any part of them, but so far as he shall give leave. And to give leave to a body politic of subjects to have an absolute representative to all intents and purposes, were to abandon the government of so much of the commonwealth, and to divide the dominion, contrary to their peace and defense, which the sovereign cannot be understood to do, by any grant that does not plainly and directly discharge them of their subjection. For consequences of words are not the signs of his will, when other consequences are signs of the contrary, but rather signs of error and misreckoning, to which all mankind is too prone. The bounds of that power which is given to the representative of a body politic are to be taken notice of from two things. One is their writ, or letters from the sovereign, the other is the law of the commonwealth. For though in the institution or acquisition of a commonwealth, which is independent, there needs no writing, because the power of the representative has there no other bounds but such as are set out by the unwritten law of nature, yet in subordinate bodies, there are such diversities of limitation necessary concerning their businesses, times, and places, as can neither be remembered without letters, nor taken notice of, unless such letters be patent, that they may be read to them, and withal sealed or testified, 
with the seals or other permanent signs of the authority sovereign. And because such limitation is not always easy or perhaps possible to be described in writing, the ordinary laws, common to all subjects, must determine what the representative may lawfully do in all cases where the letters themselves are silent. And therefore, in a body politic, if the representative be one man, whatsoever he does in the person of the body, which is not warranted in his letters, nor by the laws, is his own act, and not the act of the body, nor of any other member thereof besides himself. Because, further than his letters or the law's limit, he representeth no man's person but his own. But what he does according to these is the act of every one. For of the act of the sovereign every one is author, because he is the representative unlimited. And the act of him that recedes not from the letters of the sovereign is the act of the sovereign, and therefore every member of the body is author of it. But if the representative be an assembly, whatsoever that assembly shall decree, not warranted by their letters or the laws, is the act of the assembly, or body politic, and the act of every one by whose vote the decree was made, but not the act of any man that being present voted to the contrary, nor of any man absent, unless he voted it by procreation. It is the act of the assembly because voted by the major part, and if it be a crime, the assembly may be punished, as far forth as it is capable, as by dissolution or forfeiture of their letters, which is to such artificial and fictitious bodies, capital, or if the assembly have a common stock, wherein none of the innocent members have propriety, by pecuniary mulct. For from corporal penalties, nature hath exempted all bodies politic, but they that gave not their vote are therefore innocent, because the assembly cannot represent any man in things unwarranted by their letters, and consequently are not involved in their votes. If the person of the body politic, being in one man, borrow money of a stranger, that is, of one that is not of the same body, for no letters need limit borrowing, seeing it is left to men's own inclinations to limit lending, the debt is the representative's. For if he should have authority from his letters to make the members pay what he borroweth, he should have by consequence the sovereignty of them, and therefore the grant were either void, as proceeding from error commonly incident to human nature, and as an insufficient sign of the will of the grantor, or if it be avowed by him, then it is the representer sovereign, and falleth not under the present question, which is only of bodies subordinate. No member, therefore, is obliged to pay the debt so borrowed, but the representative himself, because he that lendeth it, being a stranger to the letters, and to the qualification of the body, understandeth those only for his debtors that are engaged, and, seeing the representer can engage himself, and none else, has him only debtor, who must therefore pay him, out of the common stock, if there be any, or, if there be none, out of his own estate. If he come into debt by contract or mulct, the case is the same. But when the representative is an assembly, and the debt to a stranger, all they, and only they, are responsible for the debt that gave their votes to the borrowing of it, or to the contract that made it due, or to the fact for which the mulct was imposed. Because every one of those, in voting, did engage himself for the payment, for he that is author of the borrowing is obliged to the payment, even of the whole debt, though when paid by any one he be discharged. But if the debt be to one of the assembly, the assembly only is obliged to the payment out of their common stock, if they have any. For having liberty of vote, if he vote the money shall be borrowed, he votes it shall be paid. If he vote it shall not be borrowed, or be absent, yet because in lending he voteth the borrowing, he contradicteth his former vote, and is obliged by the latter, and becomes both borrower and lender, and consequently cannot demand payment from any particular man, but from the common treasury only, which failing he hath no remedy, nor complaint but against himself, that being privy to the acts of the assembly, and to their means to pay, and not being enforced, 
did nevertheless through his own folly lend his money. It is manifest by this that in bodies politic subordinate, and subject to a sovereign power, it is sometimes not only lawful, but expedient, for a particular man to make open protestation against the decrees of the representative assembly, and cause their dissent to be registered, or to take witness of it, because otherwise they may be obliged to pay debts contracted, and be responsible for crimes committed by other men. But in a sovereign assembly that liberty is taken away, both because he that protesteth there denies their sovereignty, and also because whatsoever is commanded by the sovereign power is as to the subject, though not always in the sight of God, justified by the command. For of such command every subject is the author. The variety of bodies politic is almost infinite, for they are not only distinguished by the several affairs for which they are constituted, wherein there is an unspeakable diversity, but also by the times, places, and numbers, subject to many limitations. And as to their affairs, some are ordained for government, as first the government of a province may be committed to an assembly of men, wherein all resolutions shall depend on the votes of the major part, and then this assembly is a body politic, and their power limited by commission. This word province signifies a charge or care of business, which he whose business it is, committeth to another man to be administered for and under him. And therefore, when in one commonwealth there be diverse countries that have their laws distinct from one another, or are far distant in place, the administration of the government being committed to diverse persons, those countries where the sovereign is not resident, but governs by commission, are called provinces. But of the government of a province, by an assembly residing in the province itself, there be few examples. The Romans, who had the sovereignty of many provinces, yet governed them always by presidents and praetors, and not by assemblies, as they governed the city of Rome and territories adjacent. In like manner, when there were colonies sent from England to plant Virginia and summer islands, though the government of them here were committed to assemblies in London, yet did those assemblies never commit the government under them to any assembly there, but did to each plantation send one governor. For though every man, where he can be present by nature, desires to participate of government, yet where they cannot be present, they are by nature also inclined to commit the government of their common interest rather to a monarchical than a popular form of government, which is also evident in those men that have a great private estates, who, when they are unwilling to take the pains of administering the business that belongs to them, choose rather to trust one servant than an assembly either of their friends or servants. But howsoever it be in fact, yet we may suppose the government of a province or colony committed to an assembly. And when it is, that which in this place I have to say is this, that whatsoever debt is by that assembly contracted, or whatsoever unlawful act is decreed, is the act only of those that assented, and not of any that dissented, or were absent, for the reasons before alleged. Also that, an assembly residing out of the bounds of that colony, whereof they have the government, cannot execute any power over the persons or goods of any of the colony, to seize on them for debt, or other duty, in any place without the colony itself, as having no jurisdiction nor authority elsewhere, but are left to the remedy which the law of the place alloweth them. And though the assembly have right to impose mulct upon any of their members that shall break the laws they make, yet out of the colony itself they have no right to execute the same. And that which is said here of the rights of an assembly for the government of a province or a colony is applicable also to an assembly for the government of a town, a university, or a college, or a church, or for any government over the persons of men. And generally, in all bodies politic, if any particular member conceive himself injured by the body itself, the cognizance of his cause belong to the sovereign, and those the sovereign hath ordained for judges in such causes, or shall ordain for that particular cause, and not to the body itself. 
for the whole body is in this case his fellow subject, which in a sovereign assembly is otherwise. For there, if the sovereign be not judge, though in his own cause, there can be no judge at all. In a body politic, for the well-ordering of foreign traffic, the most commodious representative is an assembly of all the members, that is to say, such a one as every one that adventureth his money may be present at all the deliberations and resolutions of the body, if they will themselves. For proof whereof, we are to consider the end for which men that are merchants, and may buy and sell, export and import their merchandise, according to their own discretions, do nevertheless bind themselves up in one corporation. It is true there be few merchants that with the merchandise they buy at home can freight a ship to export it, or with that they buy abroad to bring it home, and have therefore need to join together in one society, where every man may either participate of the gain according to the proportion of his adventure, or take his own and sell what he transports or imports at such prices as he thinks fit. But this is no body politic, there being no common representative to oblige them to any other law than that which is common to all other subjects. The end of their incorporating is to make their gain the greater, which is done two ways, by soul buying and soul selling, both at home and abroad, so that to grant to a company of merchants to be a corporation, or body politic, is to grant them a double monopoly, whereof one is to be sole buyers, another to be sole sellers. For when there is a company incorporate for any particular foreign country, they only export the commodities vendable in that country, which is sole buying at home and sole selling abroad. For at home there is but one buyer, and abroad but one that selleth, both which is gainful to the merchant, because thereby they buy at home at lower, and sell abroad at higher rates. And abroad there is but one buyer of foreign merchandise, and but one that sells them at home, both which again are gainful to the adventurers. Of this double monopoly, one part is disadvantageous to the people at home, the other to foreigners. For at home, by their sole exportation, they set what price they please on the husbandry and handiworks of the people, and by the sole importation, what price they please on all foreign commodities the people have need of, both which are ill for the people. On the contrary, by the sole selling of the native commodities abroad, and sole buying the foreign commodities upon the place, they raise the price of those, and abate the price of these, to the disadvantage of the foreigner. For where but one selleth, the merchandise is the dearer, and where but one buyeth, the cheaper. Such corporations, therefore, are no other than monopolies, though they would be very profitable for a commonwealth, if, being bound up into one body in foreign markets, they were at liberty at home, every man to buy and sell at what price he could. The end, then, of these bodies of merchants, being not a common benefit to the whole body, which have in this case no common stock, but what is deducted out of the particular adventures, for building, buying, victualling, and manning of ships, but the particular gain of every adventurer, it is reason that every one be acquainted with the employment of his own, that is, that every one be of the assembly that shall have the power to order the same, and be acquainted with their accounts. And therefore the representative of such a body must be an assembly where every member of the body may be present at the consultations, if he will. If a body politic of merchants contracted debt to a stranger by the act of their representative assembly, every member is liable by himself for the whole. For a stranger can take no notice of their private laws, but considereth them as so many particular men, obliged every one to the whole payment, till payment made by one dischargeth all the rest. But if the debt be to one of the company, the creditor is debtor for the whole to himself, and cannot therefore demand his debt, but only from the common stock, if there be any. If the commonwealth impose a tax upon the body, 
it is understood to be laid upon every member proportionally to his particular adventure in the company, for there is in this case no other common stock but what is made of their particular adventures. If a mulct be laid upon the body for some unlawful act, they are only liable by whose votes the act was decreed, or by whose assistance it was executed. For in none of the rest is there any other crime but being of the body, which, if a crime, because the body was ordained by the authority of the commonwealth, is not his. If one of the members be indebted to the body, he may be sued by the body, but his goods cannot be taken, nor his person imprisoned by the authority of the body, but only by authority of the commonwealth, for they can do it by their own authority, they can by their own authority give judgment that the debt is due, which is as much as to be judge in their own cause. These bodies, made for the government of men, or of traffic, be either perpetual, or for a time prescribed by writing. But there be bodies also whose times are limited, and that only by the nature of their business. For example, if a sovereign monarch, or a sovereign assembly, shall think fit to give command to the towns, and other several parts of their territory, to send to him their deputies, to inform him of the condition and necessities of the subjects, or to advise with him for the making of good laws, or for any other cause, as with one person representing the whole country, such deputies, having a place and time of meeting assigned them, are there, and at that time, a body politic, representing every subject of that dominion. But it is only for such matters as shall be propounded unto them by that man, or assembly that by the sovereign authority sent for them. And when it shall be declared that nothing more shall be propounded, nor debated by them, the body is dissolved. For if they were the absolute representative of the people, then were it the sovereign assembly, and so there would be two sovereign assemblies, or two sovereigns over the same people, which cannot consist with their peace. And therefore, where there is once a sovereignty, there can be no absolute representation of the people, but by it. And for the limits of how far such a body shall represent the whole people, they are set forth in the writing by which they were sent for. For the people cannot choose their deputies to other intent than is in the writing directed to them from their sovereign expressed. Private bodies regular and lawful are those that are constituted without letters, or other written authority, saving the laws common to all other subjects. And because they be united in one person representative, they are held for regular, such as are all families, in which the father or master ordereth the whole family. For he obligeth his children and servants as far as the law permitteth, though not further, because none of them are bound to obedience in those actions which the law hath forbidden to be done. In all other actions, during the time they are under domestic government, they are subject to their fathers and masters, as to their immediate sovereigns. For the father and master, being before the institution of commonwealth, absolute sovereigns in their own families, they lose afterward no more of their authority than the law of the commonwealth taketh from them. Private bodies regular, but unlawful, are those that unite themselves into one person representative, without any public authority at all, such as are the corporations of beggars, thieves, and gypsies, the better to order their trade of begging and stealing, and the corporations of men that by authority from any foreign person themselves in another's dominion, for the easier propagation of doctrines, and for making a party against the power of the commonwealth. Irregular systems, in their nature but leagues, or sometimes mere concourse of people without union to any particular design, not by obligation of one to another, but proceeding only from a similitude of wills and inclinations, become lawful or unlawful, according to the lawfulness or unlawfulness of every man's particular design therein, and his design is to be understood by the occasion. The leagues of subjects, because leagues are commonly made for mutual defense, are in a commonwealth, which is no more than a league of all the subjects together, 
for the most part unnecessary, and savour of unlawful design, and are for that cause unlawful, and commonly go by the name of factions, or conspiracies. For a league, being a connection of men by covenants, if there be no power given to any one man or assembly, as in the condition of mere nature, to compel them to performance, is so long only valid, as there ariseth no just cause of distrust, and therefore leagues between commonwealths, over whom there is no human power established to keep them all in awe, are not only lawful, but also profitable for the time they last. But leagues of the subjects of one and the same commonwealth, where every one may obtain his right by means of the sovereign power, are unnecessary to the maintaining of peace and justice, and in case the design of them be evil or unknown to the commonwealth, unlawful. For all uniting of strength by private men is, if for evil intent, unjust, if for intent unknown, dangerous to the public, and unjustly concealed. If the sovereign power be in a great assembly, and a number of men, part of the assembly, without authority, consult a part to contrive the guidance of the rest, this is a faction, or conspiracy unlawful, as being a fraudulent seducing of the assembly for their particular interest. But if he whose private interest is to be debated and judged in the assembly, make as many friends as he can, in him it is no injustice, because in this case he is no part of the assembly. And though he hires such friends with money, unless there be an express law against it, yet it is not injustice. For sometimes, as men's manners are, justice cannot be had without money, and every man may think his own cause just till it be heard and judged. In all commonwealths, if a private man entertain more servants than the government of his estate and lawful employment he has for them requires, it is faction, and unlawful. For, having the protection of the commonwealth, he needeth not the defense of private force. And whereas in nations not thoroughly civilized, several numerous families have lived in continual hostility, and invaded one another with private force, yet it is evident enough that they have done unjustly, or else that they had no commonwealth. And as factions for kindred, so also factions for government of religion, as of papists, protestants, etc., or of state, as patricians and plebeians of old time in Rome, and of aristocraticals and democraticals of old time in Greece, are unjust, as being contrary to the peace and safety of the people, and a taking of the sword out of the hand of the sovereign. Concourse of people is an irregular system, the lawfulness or unlawfulness whereof dependeth on the occasion, and on the number of them that are assembled. If the occasion be lawful and manifest, the concourse is lawful, as the usual meeting of men at church or at a public show, in usual numbers. For if the numbers be extraordinarily great, the occasion is not evident, and consequently he that cannot render a particular and good account of his being amongst them is to be judged conscious of an unlawful and tumultuous design. It may be lawful for a thousand men to join in a petition to be delivered to a judge or magistrate, yet if a thousand men come to present it, it is a tumultuous assembly, because there needs but one or two for that purpose. But in such cases as these, it is not a set number that makes the assembly unlawful, but such a number as the present officers are not able to suppress and bring to justice. When an unusual number of men assemble against a man whom they accuse, the assembly is an unlawful tumult, because they may deliver their accusation to the magistrate by a few, or by one man. Such was the case of St. Paul of Ephesus, where Demetrius and a great number of other men brought two of Paul's companions before the magistrate, saying with one voice, quote, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, unquote, which was their way of demanding justice against them, for teaching the people such doctrine as was against their religion and trade. The occasion here, considering the laws of that people, was just. 
yet was their assembly judged unlawful, and the magistrate reprehended them for it, in these words, quote, If Demetrius and the other workmen can accuse any man of anything, there be pleas and deputies. Let them accuse one another. And if you have any other thing to demand, your case may be judged in an assembly lawfully called. For we are in danger to be accused for this day's sedition, because there is no cause by which any man can render any reason of this concourse of people. Unquote. Acts 19.40 Where he calleth an assembly whereof men can give no just account, a sedition, and such as they could not answer for. And this is all I shall say concerning systems, and assemblies of people, which may be compared, as I said, to the similar parts of man's body, such as be lawful to the muscles, such as are unlawful to winds, biles, and apostems, engendered by the unnatural conflux of evil humors. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Leviathan》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arrowit.《Leviathan》by Thomas Hobbes — Chapter Twenty Three — Of the Public Ministers of Sovereign Power in the last chapter I have spoken of the similar parts of a commonwealth. In this I shall speak of the parts organical, which are public ministers. A public minister is he that by the sovereign, whether a monarch or an assembly, is employed in any affairs, with authority to represent in that employment the person of the commonwealth. And whereas every man or assembly that hath sovereignty representeth two persons, or, as the more common phrase is, has two capacities, one natural and another politic. As a monarch hath the person not only of the commonwealth, but also of a man, and the sovereign assembly hath the person not only of the commonwealth, but also of the assembly, that they be servants to them in their natural capacity, are not public ministers, but those only that serve them in the administration of the public business. And therefore neither ushers nor sergeants nor other officers that wait on the assembly for no other purpose but for the commodity of the men assembled in an aristocracy or democracy, nor stewards, chamberlains, cofferers, or any other officers of the household of a monarch, are public ministers in a monarchy. Of public ministers, some have charge committed to them of a general administration, either of the whole dominion or of a part thereof. Of the whole, as to a protector or regent, may be committed by the predecessor of an infant king during his minority, the whole administration of his kingdom, in which case every subject is so far obliged to obedience as the ordinances he shall make, and the commands he shall give be in the king's name, and not inconsistent with his sovereign power. Of a part or province, as when either a monarch or a sovereign assembly shall give the general charge thereof to a governor, lieutenant, prefect, or viceroy, and in this case also, Every one of that province is obliged to all he shall do in the name of the sovereign, and that not incompatible with the sovereign's right. For such protectors, viceroys, and governors have no other right but what depends on the sovereign's will, and no commission that can be given them can be interpreted for a declaration of the will to transfer the sovereignty, without express and perspicuous words to that purpose. And this kind of public ministers resembleth the nerves and tendons that move the several limbs of a body natural. Others have special administration, that is to say, charges of some special business, either at home or abroad. As at home, first, for the economy of a commonwealth, that they have authority concerning the treasury, as tributes, impositions, rents, fines, or whatsoever public revenue, to collect, receive, issue, or take the accounts thereof, are public ministers. Ministers, because they serve the person representative, and can do nothing against his command, nor without his authority. Public, because they serve him in his political capacity. Secondly, they that have authority concerning the militia, 
to have the custody of arms, forts, ports, to levy, pay, or conduct soldiers, or to provide for any necessary thing for the use of war, either by land or sea, are public ministers. But a soldier without command, though he fight for the commonwealth, does not therefore represent the person of it, because there is none to represent it to. For every one that hath command represents it to them only whom he commandeth. They also that have the authority to teach, or to enable others to teach, the people, their duty to the sovereign power, and instruct them in the knowledge of what is just and unjust, thereby to render them more apt to live in godliness and in peace amongst themselves, and resist the public enemy, are public ministers. Ministers in that they do it not by their own authority, but by another's, and public because they do it, or should do it, by no authority but that of the sovereign. The monarch of the sovereign assembly only hath immediate authority from God to teach and instruct the people, and no man but the sovereign receiveth his power dea gratia simply, that is to say, from the favor of none but God. All other receive theirs from the favor and providence of God and their sovereigns, as in a monarchy dea gratia et regis, or dea providentia et voluntate regis. They also to whom jurisdiction is given are public ministers, for in their seats of justice they represent the person of the sovereign, and the sentence is his sentence. For, as hath been before declared, all judicature is essentially annexed to the sovereignty, and therefore all other judges are but ministers of him or them that have the sovereign power. And as controversies are of two sorts, namely of fact and of law, so are judgments, some of fact, some of law. And consequently in the same controversy there may be two judges, one of fact, another of law. And in both these controversies there may arise a controversy between the party judged and the judge, which, because they both be servants to the sovereign, ought in equity to be judged by men agreed on by consent of both, for no man can be judged in his own case. But the sovereign is already agreed on for judged by them both, and is therefore either to hear the cause and determine it himself, or appoint for judge such as they shall both agree on. And this agreement is then understood to be made between them diverse ways, as first, if the defendant be allowed to accept against such of his judges, whose interest maketh him suspect them, for as to the complainant he hath already chosen his own judge, those which he accepteth not against are judges he himself agrees on. Secondly, if he appeal to any other judge, he can appeal no further, for his appeal is his choice. Thirdly, if he appeal to the sovereign himself, and he by himself, or by delegates which the party shall agree on, give sentence, that sentence is final, for the defendant is judged by his own judges, that is to say, by himself. These properties of just and rational judicature considered, I cannot forbear to observe the excellent constitution of the courts of justice established both for common and also for public pleas in England. By common pleas, I mean those where both the complainant and defendant are subjects, and by public, which are also called pleas of the crown, those were the complainant of the sovereign. For whereas there were two orders of men, whereof one was lords, the other commons, the lords had this privilege, to have for judges in all capital crimes none but lords, as many as would be present, which, being ever acknowledged as a privilege of favor, their judges were none but such as they had themselves desired. And in all controversies, every subject, as also in civil controversies the lords, had for judges men of the country where the matter in controversy lay, against which he might make his exceptions, till at last twelve men without exception being agreed on, they were judged by those twelve so that having his own judges, there could be nothing alleged by the party why the sentence should not be final. These public persons, with authority from the sovereign power, either to instruct or judge the people, are such members of the commonwealth as may fitly be compared to the organs of voice in a body natural. Public ministers are also those that have authority from the sovereign to procure the execution of judgments given, to publish the sovereign's commands, to suppress tumults to apprehend and imprison malefactors, and other acts tending to the conservation of the peace. For every act they do by such authority is the act of the commonwealth, and their service answerable to that of the hands and the body natural. Public ministers abroad are those that represent the person of their own sovereign to foreign states. Such are ambassadors, messengers, agents, and heralds, sent by public authority and on public business. But such are sent by authority only of some private party of a troubled state, though they be received, 
are neither public nor private ministers of the commonwealth, because none of their actions have the commonwealth for author. Likewise, an ambassador sent from a prince to congratulate, condole, or to assist in a solemnity, though the authority be public, yet because the business is private, and belonging to him in his natural capacity is a private person. Also, if a man be sent into another country, secretly to explore their counsels and strength, though both the authority and the business be public, yet because there is none to take notice of any person in him but his own, he is but a private minister, but yet a minister of the commonwealth, and may be compared to an eye in the body natural. And those that are appointed to receive the petitions or other informations of the people, and are, as it were, the public ear, are public ministers and represent their sovereign in that office. Neither a counsellor nor a council of state, if we consider with no authority judicature or command, but only of giving advice to the sovereign when it is required, or of offering it when it is not required, is a public person. For the advice is addressed to the sovereign only, whose person cannot in his own presence be represented to him by another. But a body of counsellors are never without some other authority, either of judicature or of immediate administration. As in a monarchy, they represent the monarch in delivering his commands to the public ministers. In a democracy, the council or senate propounds the result of their deliberations to the people as a council. But when they appoint judges, or hear causes, or give audience to the ambassadors, it is the quality of a minister of the people, and in an aristocracy the council of state is a sovereign assembly itself, and gives counsel to none but themselves. End of chapter 23「Leviathan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simum. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter 24 Of the Nutrition and Procreation of a Commonwealth The nutrition of a commonwealth consisteth in the plenty and distribution of materials conducing to life, in concoction or preparation, and, when concocted, in the conveyance of it by convenient conduits to the public use. As for the plenty of matter, it is a thing limited by nature to those commodities which, from the two breasts of our common mother, land and sea, God usually either freely giveth, or for labour selleth to mankind. For the matter of this nutriment, consisting in animals, vegetables, and minerals, God hath freely laid them before us, in or near to the face of the earth, so as there needed no more but the labour and industry of receiving them. Insomuch as plenty dependeth, next to God's favour, merely on the labour and industry of men. This matter, commonly called commodities, is partly native and partly foreign. Native, that which is to be had within the territory of the commonwealth foreign that which is imported from without and because there is no territory under the dominion of one commonwealth except it be of very vast extent that produceth all things needful for the maintenance and motion of the whole body and few that produce not something more than necessary the superfluous commodities to be had within become no more superfluous but supply these wants at home by importation of that which may be had abroad either by exchange, or by just war, or by labour. For a man's labour also is a commodity exchangeable for benefit, as well as any other thing. And there have been commonwealths that, having no more territory than hath served them for habitation, have nevertheless not only maintained, but also increased their power, partly by the labour of trading from one place to another, and partly by selling the manufacturers, whereof the materials were brought in from other places. The distribution of the materials of this nourishment is the constitution of mine and thine and his, that is to say, in one word, propriety, and belonged in all kinds of commonwealth to the sovereign power. For where there is no commonwealth there is, as hath been already shown, a perpetual war of every man against his neighbour, and therefore everything is his that getteth it and keepeth it by force, which is neither propriety nor community, but uncertainty which is so evident that even Cicero, a passionate defender of liberty, in a public pleading attributed all propriety to the law civil. Let the civil law, said he, be once abandoned, or but negligently guarded, not to say oppressed, and there is nothing that any man can be sure to receive from his ancestor, or leave to his children. And again, 
Take away the civil law, and no man knows what is his own, and what another man's. Seeing, therefore, the introduction of propriety is an effect of commonwealth, which can do nothing but by the person that represents it, it is the act only of the sovereign, and consisteth in the laws, which none can make that have not the sovereign power. And this they well knew of old, who called that nomos, that is to say distribution, which we call law, and define justice by distributing to every man his own. In this distribution the first law is for division of the land itself, wherein the sovereign assigneth to every man a portion, according as he, and not according as any subject, or any number of them, shall judge agreeable to equity and the common good. The children of Israel were a commonwealth in the wilderness, but wanted the commodities of the earth till they were masters of the land of promise, which afterward was divided amongst them, not by their own discretion, but by the discretion of Eleazar the priest, and Joshua their general who, when there were twelve tribes, making them thirteen by subdivision of the tribe of Joseph, made nevertheless but twelve portions of the land, and ordained for the tribe of Levi no land, but assigned them the tenth part of the whole fruits, which division was therefore arbitrary. And though a people coming into possession of a land by war do not always exterminate the ancient inhabitants, as did the Jews, but leave to many, or most, or all of them their estates, yet it is manifest they hold them afterwards, as of the victor's distribution, as the people of England held all theirs of William the Conqueror. From whence we may collect that the propriety which a subject hath in his lands consisteth in a right to exclude all other subjects from the use of them, and not to exclude their sovereign, be it an assembly or a monarch. Foreseeing the sovereign, that is to say the commonwealth, whose person he represented, is understood to do nothing but in order to the common peace and security. This distribution of lands is to be understood as done in order to the same, and consequently whatsoever distribution he shall make in prejudice thereof is contrary to the will of every subject that committed his peace and safety to his discretion and conscience, and therefore by the will of every one of them is to be reputed void. It is true that a sovereign monarch, or the greater part of a sovereign assembly, may ordain the doing of many things in pursuit of their passions, contrary to their own consciences, which is a breach of trust and of the law of nature. But this is not enough to authorize any subject, either to make war upon, or so much as to accuse of injustice, or any way to speak evil of their sovereign, because they have authorized all his actions, and, in bestowing the sovereign power, made them their own but in what cases the commands of sovereigns are contrary to equity and the law of nature is to be considered hereafter in another place. In the distribution of land, the commonwealth itself may be conceived to have a portion, and possess and improve the same by their representative, and that such portion may be made sufficient to sustain the whole expense to the common peace and defence necessarily required which were very true, if there could be any representative, conceived free from human passions and infirmities. But the nature of man being as it is, the setting forth of public land, or of any certain revenue for the commonwealth, is in vain, and tended to the dissolution of government, to the condition of mere nature, and war, as soon as ever the sovereign power falleth into the hands of a monarch, or of an assembly, that are either too negligent of money, or too hazardous in engaging the public stock into long or costly war. Commonwealths can endure no diet, for seeing their expense is not limited by their own appetite, but by external accidents and the appetites of their neighbours, the public riches cannot be limited by other limits than those which the emergent occasions shall require. And whereas in England there were by the conqueror diverse lands reserved to his own use, besides forests and chases, either for his recreation or for preservation of woods, and diverse services reserved on the land he gave his subjects, yet it seems they were not reserved for his maintenance in his public, but in his natural capacity. For he and his successors did, for all that, lay arbitrary taxes on all subjects' land when they judged it necessary. Or if those public lands and services were ordained as a sufficient maintenance of the commonwealth, it was contrary to the scope of the institution, being, as it appeared by those ensuing taxes, insufficient, and, as it appears by the late small revenue of the crown, subject to alienation and diminution. 
it is therefore in vain to assign a portion to the commonwealth, which may sell or give it away, and thus sell and give it away when it is done by their representative. As the distribution of lands at home, so also to assign in what places and for what commodities the subject shall traffic abroad belong to the sovereign. For if it did belong to private persons to use their own discretion therein, some of them would be drawn for gain, both to furnish the enemy with means to hurt the commonwealth, and hurt it themselves by importing such things as, pleasing men's appetites, be nevertheless noxious, or at least unprofitable to them. And therefore it belonged to the commonwealth, that is, to the sovereign only, to approve or disapprove both of the places and matter of foreign traffic. Further, seeing it is not enough to the sustentation of a commonwealth that every man have a propriety in a portion of land, or in some few commodities, or a natural property in some useful art, and there is no art in the world but is necessary either for the being or well-being almost of every particular man, it is necessary that men distribute that which they can spare, and transfer their propriety therein mutually one to another by exchange and mutual contract. And therefore it belonged to the commonwealth, that is to say to the sovereign, to appoint in what manner all kinds of contract between subjects, as buying, selling, exchanging, borrowing, lending, letting, and taking to hire, are to be made, and by what words, and words and sign, they shall be understood for valid. And for the matter and distribution of the nourishment to the several members of the commonwealth, thus much, considering the model of the whole work, is sufficient. By concoction, I understand the reducing of all commodities which are not presently consumed, but reserved for nourishment in time to come, to something of equal value, and withal so portable as not to hinder the motion of men from place to place, to the end a man may have, in what place soever, such nourishment as the place affordeth. And this is nothing else but gold, and silver, and money. For gold and silver, being, as it happens, almost in all countries of the world highly valued, is a commodious measure of the value of all things else between nations, and money, of what matter soever coined by the sovereign of a commonwealth, is a sufficient measure of the value of all things else between the subjects of that commonwealth, by the means of which measures all commodities, movable and immovable, are made to accompany a man to all places of his resort, within and without the place of his ordinary residence, and the same passeth from man to man within the commonwealth and goes round about, nourishing, as it passeth, every part thereof, insomuch as this concoction is, as it were, the sanguification of the commonwealth. For natural blood is in like manner made of the fruits of the earth, and, circulating, nourisheth, by the way, every member of the body of man. And because silver and gold have their value from the matter itself, they have first this privilege, that the value of them cannot be altered by the power of one nor of a few commonwealths, as being a common measure of the commodities of all places. But base money may easily be enhanced or abased. Secondly, they have the privilege to make commonwealths move and stretch out their arms, when need is, into foreign countries, and supply not only private subjects that travel, but also whole armies with provision. But that coin which is not considerable for the matter, but for the stamp of the place, being unable to endure a change of air, hath its effect at home only, where also it is subject to the change of laws, and thereby to have the value diminished, to the prejudice many times of those that have it. The conduits and ways by which it is conveyed to the public use are of two sorts, one that conveyeth it to the public coffers, the other that issueth the same out again for public payments. Of the first sort are collectors, receivers, and treasurers. Of the second are the treasurers again, and the officers appointed for payment of several public or private ministers. And in this also the artificial man maintains his resemblance with the natural, whose veins, receiving the blood from the several parts of the body, carry it to the heart, where, being made vital, the heart by the arteries sends it out again, to enliven and enable for motion all the members of the same. The procreation, or children of a commonwealth, are those we call plantations, or colonies, which are numbers of men sent out from the commonwealth, under a conductor or governor, to inhabit a foreign country, 
either formerly void of inhabitants or made void then by war. And when a colony is settled, they are either a commonwealth of themselves, discharged of their subjection to their sovereign that sent them, as hath been done by many commonwealths of ancient time, in which case the commonwealth from which they went was called their metropolis, or mother, and requires no more of them than fathers require of the children whom they emancipate and make free from their domestic government, which is honour and friendship, or else they remain united to their metropolis, as were the colonies of the people of Rome. And then they are no commonwealths themselves, but provinces, and parts of the commonwealth that sent them. So that the right of colonies, saving honour and league with their metropolis, depended wholly on their license, or letters, by which their sovereign authorised them to plant. End of chapter 24